Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Scott from Politico. We have a great panel for you this afternoon on... Well, <laughs> okay, there we go. Maybe an earthquake. Um, on more social good in tech and more tech in social good. So you don't need to be living in a, you know, in a cave for the last couple of years to not notice the, the many headlines we've had recently about you know, the, the role of large tech companies in our lives, trolling on, uh, on Twitter, misinformation on Facebook, but at the same time, we also, in the, in the news, you see a lot of, of the, the world's greatest challenges, be it climate change, be it the refugee crisis, and some of these challenges have never been more pronounced as they are right now. So we're here today to talk about some of the, you know, maybe putting the soul back in, into the tech industry, but also to use tech to help uh, overcome some of these social changes and, and, certain, and, and focus on the social good for, for all of humanity. I want to start with Munir. Um, welcome. Um, I want to understand, maybe start from a very top line level, of what role do you think tech can play to solve some of these, the, you know, to help the, with the social good? First, you, you have to see it uh, as a part of the vision, of the political vision you have toward the world, a political vision that you have uh, for your country, for your continent. It's not something that is apart from what you think as a, as, a, as a global view for the society. Yesterday we talked a lot about this contract for the web and about the value of the web. And what I answered is that everything we believe for the web, everything we believe for the tech, everything we believe in technologies is linked to the value we have in France and the value we have in Europe. When we believe in tech for the planet, tech for the humans, and resume that and in tech for good, it's because we believe and we have always believed that the market has to be for the human and for the planet because we believe that the economy had to have in mind that it, it has to serve the humans and the planet and every time we forget that this is where we go into crisis cycles so the responsibility we have is to not look at the digital and technology world differently at, at how we look at the world and for 30 years we looked at technologies and at the internet as something quite new, as something quite uh, interesting, innovative. So we shouldn't look at it with the same exigence we have for economy and for the others. But now came the age of maturity. Now came the age of technology everywhere, of internet everywhere. And now came the responsibility everywhere for technology. And that's why we still strongly believe in performance. We need the best technology possible. We need to have the best researcher. We need to have the best startups. We need to create profit over these technologies and, and startups. But we also have a mandatory goal, which is to have impact on the planet and the human, and a positive impact, on human, and it can go together. Monique, someone who has worked on both sides of the aisle, both you know, at Cisco and now as a, as a, in a nonprofit, I mean, would you agree with, with the minister? To some extent, um, I, I, of course, technology should be for social good. And those, uh, of, of course, it should be. But I think we need to, to, to kind of turn the, the conversation around a little bit. And that is that the human being that is the center of this, what I have termed earlier with my colleagues, and the people-centered internet or economy, is the center of that universe, right? Because right now we're in a task-based ta task economy. So we should be able to use, for example, uh, something that I was talking about, which goes to social good. Um, using artificial intelligence to actually find you, the job that you want to have, with the people you want to work, earning much more money than you have ever done before, and oh, by the way, there would be a commission to that. Why not do that? There's something called the dignity of work, which is social, brings social value. So that's something we should think about. The other component of it is, when you're talking about tech for social good and being on both sides of the aisle, you have to look at what is the intentionality of technology. It has no agency. Right? You could see what is the potential for abuse. Who is creating these technologies? Who otherwise you have echo chambers of cognitive bias. How inclusive, how diverse are the mindsets? And to say this is the way technology can be used, anything over that is a red line. I'm also involved in IEEE for ethics and autonomous intelligence systems, and we are looking very closely about the value of ethics in what it is we do uh, in, in setting the tone for technology. So to summarize from my perspective, again, and, and I think we'll find some levels of agreement here, being on, having been on both sides of the aisle, 
is that you've got to be declarative of the technology. You've got to look at how, this is a manifesto, how you can use artificial for work. Artificial intelligence to find what it is you want to do uh, with the people you want to work with, earn more money, and oh, by the way, uh, there, is, there will be a fee. People have the right to do that. And it's a nice, because right now, artificial intelligence is sort of a, a cost. What about an earning power to it? We're not talking about a dystopian view. So I think this is an opportunity. Jan, with, with your uh, organization, uh, Social Accelerator for Good, you're obviously looking at some of these issues. I mean, what are some of the friction points here? Uh, again, I agree with a lot with what Monique is saying, but making that happen in practice is quite difficult. So when it comes to, to your work, where are some of the barriers and challenges do you see in implementing this? Um, well, uh, to begin with the, the story of the Social Good Accelerator, we were here two years ago and uh, we realized that social innovation was not part of the discussion. Uh, this uh, event is gathering uh, the greater, greatest innovators uh, worldwide, but social innovators, they were absent. Uh, so we decided to um, change things and to uh, uh, come with some social innovators uh, because we think it's time to ally to uh, really tackle uh, climate change and also uh, to tackle uh, the rise of inequalities uh, that are uh, threatening democracies in Europe and elsewhere, uh, see Brazil. Uh, so um, it is really important now to ally forces uh, and to really um, acknowledge of um, expertise, different expertise. Tech uh, is really efficient and is going really fast and it creates uh, economic value, uh, which is uh, necessary <laughs> uh, because uh, social innovation needs fundings uh, and governments are uh, um, uh, working on uh, the consultation between actors and uh, fixing uh, drivers uh, to reach uh, the SDGs, for example, uh, or uh, in Europe to reach uh, all the goals, uh, such as uh, data protection, for example. Uh, and uh, NGOs, they raise uh, awareness and they also experimenting solutions to tackle these issues. And then we need to scale up social innovation. So now it's really the, ti the time to scale up and to accelerate social innovation with tech means like fundings, but also with skills and also with product and services. And from now on, I think the two worlds are really uh, different. They don't uh, talk the same language. It's two really a different kind of innovation, but we need to gather them and to make them work to really solve the issues we are facing, which are really threatening. Okay, so if now is the time to, for, for action. We've got two politicians on stage, so I'm going to talk to uh, Connors here. I mean, what can the Commission or a national government do, and we'll come to me in a second on this, to help with this? If, if the goodwill is there, the, the technology is there, the, the, the means are there, what it, how do we take it to the next level? I think that we are really at a, a tipping point, kind of a magic moment where you feel that Technology will change your lives in the way you uh, cure diseases, in the way you solve problems. I was just one month ago in Delft and I was looking at the first quantum computer, a computer that will be able to solve problems that today we don't even imagine we have. And so it's fantastic for the economy, it's fantastic for the people. But at the same time, the disconnect in between tech and democracy is becoming so, so wide that that will be our challenge as politicians. And so when I looked at the subject of the panel, like or the social good, I think that the social good in tech is exactly how can I change the institutions that were designed in a vertical way, in a physical world, and that today we live in a digital horizontal world. So how can you as a politician in an institution that takes years to decide on a new law or a new directive in the terms of Europe to basically do it in a way that when it's done, there's an effect on people. But when it's done three years down the road, I mean, technology is already 10 times ahead. So how do you move that? And you have really to go to the deep root cause, which is that institutions were not designed to basically live in the world we live in. And I, I think if we are able as politicians 
to tackle that, to use technology to change the institutions, then we can solve the problem. But today we try to solve the problems without changing the root cause, without changing how institutions work. And so it's this kind of tension between the institutions and the world that are creating the divide. And the more you go, what people that are in this room will listen to is a politician that stays and comes and says, look, let's destroy the institutions, let's do it something totally different. And people say yes, yes, because the institutions are not working as we wish. And so how do you do that not in a revolutionary way, because you know that if you destroy institutions, it's going to be worse, but that you change institutions to live in this new, new world. And so I am a believer of how you can redesign and co-design laws, or you can look at regulation in a way that people participate, because people don't want politicians anymore that have a vision and want to tell you what the future will be and tell you, come with me. People want to co-design that future with you as a politician. And so how do you do that? And that's the big challenge. And that's one of the things that has fascinated me in the last couple of years, and that I've been working very much at the European Commission to actually find ways of making the citizens part of my decisions. Uh, and, and that's very challenging. I see uh, we have two panelists shaking uh, in agreement. Monero, yeah. you've been quite quiet there. Is the French government fit for purpose when it comes to dealing with some of these, these questions that Carl just mentioned? Yeah, governments is at the heart of being able to organize this discussion at the national and international level. And as Carlos explained, and as we have uh, done it the last few years in France and in Europe, you cannot do it alone as politician. You are elected in uh, multiple times in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a five years row, but in between, the only way to tackle these new subjects that are completely new, we have no past, we have no history of that. There are no good way to do it. There are no benchmarks, what you know that you should and imperatively do. There are only a new path that we need to create. The only way is to do one thing. First, is to create a diversity of point of view and be sure that you create the best context for having new experts emerging from the science, new experts coming from the civil society, new experiments coming from the civil society. And what is uh, Madame Bretesche doing in France is absolutely essential if we want to see new social entrepreneurs in action so that they can make mistakes, so that they can explain to the rest of the citizens and to the government what have worked, what haven't worked yet. Because to tell you the truth, we haven't the answers of what should become the social good tech. Is it only the tech that should become more social? Or is, it, or is there somewhere a space for something that is purely social and with tech in it? The answer is in between of everything of that, but we haven't yet the rules of this, uh, of this new uh, moment. And what we truly believe with President Macron is that we need to make Europe a place where this discussion exists, a place where these actors can uh, emerge and make Europe a place where we can create this new agile governance of technologies for tomorrow. It's based on performance, it's based on values, but it's based on the people. And the panel that we represent is at the right image of what could be a multi-stakeholders discussion uh, on this subject. Monique. Yes, so I live in, I live in Switzerland, and um, an example of this type of inclusion for social good is uh, in Zurich we have something called Trust Square. So think about the notion of Trust Square. What is nice as an example, because I'd like to bring it concrete, uh, is that in this, in this community you have parliamentarians, because you're talking about reg tech also, uh, you have investors, you have people in the startup, you have people who are at the university level, meeting a variety of people, meeting uh, to talk about, in this particular case, around let's look at blockchain, what can you do with blockchain in the community. And let me give you an example of that type of inclusion. Um, there is going to, there's an event where they will have blockchain for people over age 55. You know, I mean, because it doesn't have to be a magical, magical, everybody has to be sort of included in this type of discussion. What is nice, to the point of our, our, of our parliamentarians here, and also to, to somebody who's in this, this space also, with their heart and soul, is that everybody is in one room and they're working with each other so that they don't over-rotate and over-regulate 
for the very reasons that have been cited, you have to have a, an ex a, 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 I would say, a playground for experimentation such that it is truly, truly inclusive. So I, I was walking around this morning uh, across Rome and there's a lot of people both here in the forum as well as out, out here in, in Lisbon who probably want to get involved. No one, does, no one doesn't want to fight for climate change. No one doesn't want to help uh, you know, with the refugee crisis. But maybe it's a question of where do I begin? Where do I start? Maybe, Jeanne, uh, can you give us examples of you know, how can people get involved? Where, can, where is some of this collaboration that would help bring this yeah. to the fore? Um. Well, we have already many tools uh, to be involved. Uh, if, for example, you are an employee of a, a startup of a, a bigger corporation, uh, you can uh, be involved in uh, philanthropy or in pro bono. You can share your skills uh, with a, a nonprofit uh, who needs digital transition, for example, uh, or to need to work on user experiments for uh, their beneficiaries. So, and it's really um, good uh, also for the company because uh, it, uh, it nourishes creativity uh, for the employees. Uh, so that already exists, but um, uh, you know the one person pledge? Uh, yes, we, we haven't reached the one person yet. <laughs> so yeah, corporations and startups, uh, they really need to get into it. Uh, we have to accelerate that, in mm -hmm. fact because yeah, issues are here and we have to address them really, really fast. Monique. Yes, so there is a refugee on my board. <laughs> I mean, you do not talk about refugees without refugees being part of the conversation. So that's just not a disservice to, to them. And he happens to be in Berlin. But on the other hand, uh, just as an example, we're part of a winning team, MIT Solve, where uh, in the issue of uh, closing the caregiver, global caregiver, uh, shortage, we actually um, um, did win for 2018, where we were looking at how do you take, how do you work with refugees and various organizations to use these technologies to credential them, to actually credential them, to address the shortage. I mean, I've been to Jordan, so and I've been to the camps to address the shortage. Um, that is global and to put dignity back in their hands because one of the things that uh, when you w talk with refugees is that they want to they want to work and They want to be able to have no matter what the Mechanism you use those credentials be recognized maybe from the government of France such that they can come in and actually work and so they're in because what happens for resettlement or as an example people are paying 20 30 40 thousand euros just to bridge and they end up being on the social system so now we have an example where we're actually looking at uh, we won so now we have to deliver uh, that uh, addressing the, the caregiver shortage globally and looking at how we can do it even better at a Mac uh, at a global level even further beyond the example in Jordan so no, I, I just wanted to chip in on something that we created that I think was uh, very concrete we have this platform called science for refugees because we found that a lot of people that would come they could not connect with universities uh, they didn't know how to send a cv they were researchers back there but they couldn't get it and so we created a site where we have more than 100 universities that have openings for uh, refugees uh, that have done research in their countries and we just do the matchmaking and you know something so simple that basically uh, really was at no cost for the taxpayer, was just putting together, has had more effect on my life of seeing it than other things that we do with a lot of money. You know, and, and so sometimes not about the money, it's about trying to connect with the technology um, and also giving the empowerment to the public servants to do it without needing really to ask you or going back to the political power. I mean, if you think it's a good idea, the public service should empower you to do that. And if you do a mistake, you just do a mistake, uh, but you're not gonna be fired for that. You just open the system. And so we created this incentive system at the commission level to people to have ideas, to implement the ideas. And, and this was an idea that was really 
came from the ground was really grassroots of the public servants. So I think it's also a lot of how do you change the mentality in the public service. And, and that's something that is, is not easy because, again, it was not designed for that, but uh, that you have to do. So um, I just wanted to, to give the example. So we seem to be agreeing a lot with each other on the panel. So let me be somewhat contrarian and say that technology is neutral. It is just a, a tool to be used and, and therefore it's and then we've talked about economic value that tech can create. Why can't tech just pr provide the economic resources through tax revenue to the government and then the government and other officials do take, take it from there? Why do we need tech to get more involved? It, again, being contrarian here, isn't it, it's not, it's not their job. It's the it's politician's job to, to really take care of that element of the, the puzzle. I think it's an old world thinking though, what you're, because it's, these are two worlds that are coming together. We were talking about reg tech uh, uh, earlier. I mean, look, we live in a world, the minute you have a phone, I mean, if you look at the re refugees, all of them, most of them have a phone. In fact, one refugee has basically said it's an academic study that it was an extension of their body. So once you have something like that, you're already in the tech world. I mean, you cannot close the tech world out. However, it's responsible use. And that was, there are some discussions around what responsible use looks like. I mean, there was an earlier discussion that I was listening to about, uh, can I take this and be abusive with tech? Can I look at um, using it uh, such that the, the democratization example, and this is very, very dystopian, is if I don't like you, that little spider in your, in your bathroom could be a little baby drone, and I could have anthrax, and there you go. So the potential, the polarity between mass empowerment and mass destruction is very fine, fine, finite, and it's very sen and that finite, but it's very sensitive. And so we have to be responsible, be aware of its use and potential for abuse. Munir, where is the balance there between, to Tomonik's point about, obviously these two worlds are coming together, the responsibility that tech has to pay to be a, a, a quote, good actor and also the need for governments to also take a responsibility for this. To put it simply, technology is the most massive transforming force of our society and, and, and the transformation of our world right now. With this huge force, with this huge capacity to transform every single aspect of what we do, comes this responsibility. But you know, it's very political. For 30 years we believed that technology was neutral. But you can see right now in the world that you can decide that technology is only for profit. Some people even have created high theories explaining that only the profit can make technology go even further, even, even faster. Because there is profit, because there is uh, um, technology uh, and, and innovation. There are other countries that believe that technology is here to control the people, to create more security. And that's why they will invest in technology, because technology will help them to control. And there is another model, and Europe is trying to be the lead on this subject, saying that the reason why we want to innovate, the reason why we put billions, ten bi ten, tens billions of euros every year in Europe for technology and innovation with public money, with money from the citizens, is because we believe technology can also change the world where we live, it can change the planet, it can change what we do for the humans. And this can also be the driver for technology. I don't believe in a world where technology is only led by profit. I don't believe in a world where technology is only led by control. But I want to believe in a world where technology is led by human and, and the impact on the planet, but still have the same level of exigence for performance. I want the best technology possible in Europe. I just I don't want to be less technological and less innovative than the, uh, other countries. I want us to be the best, but with a purpose. There, there, there is value to minister's um, point there is value to purposeful yeah. I mean everybody wants to have a purpose purposeful doesn't mean philanthropy for philanthropy's sake it's purposeful it's not for profit it's not profit it's you know for profit versus for purpose and there's a really a, level, uh, a gravitation to something that is purposeful people want purposeful intentional use of technology and uh, just like me I think that if we want to differentiate Europe if we want Europe to lead, I think that making this vision of having in Europe, as France did and Munir did in France, having AI for humanity, having internet for the good, 
all that as principles of the European project, I think that is about leadership. And the world needs that kind of leadership. The world needs a European Union that is strong about these values and that we agree that we want to lead the world. I mean, there was times that other parts of the world were leading, but now we have to lead. And it is up to us, up to the countries in the European Union. So I'm very excited about all these new wave and everything that the younger people here will see in terms of quantum computing and in terms of biotech and other sciences that unite this physical and digital world for the good. And, and it's our responsibility, it's your responsibility. You said about the governments. I mean, the governments today, I mean, they are just part of the puzzle. So you cannot count on the governments. You have to count on you and your purpose and uh, the way that you want to live your life. So it's not about the governments, it's about you. And as Europeans, we have that responsibility towards the world because we were the center for uh, decades and centuries because we invested in science and innovation and we had values. So that's up to us. I know we have about a minute and a half left. I'm yeah. just do a quick fire round, something left to right. So uh, sorry, Nick, you're on the spot here. In, in a very short, brief sentence, what do you think, in, uh, something small that can be done now to make tech work for social goods? Put the human back into the center, as I said before. And, and we're in that direction, but I really think Europe has a chance to do exactly that when we talk about it as a manifesto. Given all of the dynamics, uh, I think uh, having a people-centered economy is the way to go. My short message will be for the next European election. When you will vote, when you will ask for the politician to discuss about the future of Europe, ask them what is their vision of technology, ask them what they want to do with the sense of development of the technology. There is a way to go for technology for good, there is a way to have technology that won't serve the people and the planet, and I think the people of Europe have chosen already. Yeah, uh, on our side, we think it's time to really accelerate social change uh, and tackle climate change by uh, accelerating alliances between tech and social innovators. Uh, and it's time to make it for good and to cut the bullshit jobs and economy. Uh, we have a manifesto and it's time really to raise awareness uh, on the solution uh, that already exists within the social innovation community. No, I, I think that probably uh, the ones that are sitting here today, it's your responsibility to look at the next European elections for the ones that are European and to think what are the politicians that you will elect? Are the ones that have in their programs that they will use technology to reduce inequality? Are the ones that really look into the future and uh, look at technology as a tool uh, for social good? Or you're going to vote for uh, politicians that just want to destroy the system. Uh, or for politicians that are not in the future, that look into the past because they don't know about technology, they don't understand technology. So it's about you, uh, because the politicians are just the mirror of society. And you have to participate to change that. So um, please uh, vote in the next European elections. It's important for all of us. And on that get out to vote message, I think we're going to call it a day. Thank you so much. Thank you.